Hi there. Good evening. You are listening Deshi Read and I'm Asif welcoming you all from Denmark. Today we are going to talk about the contemporary problem with mink killing in Denmark and with that we are going to ask a very pertinent question which is do animal deserve rights like human and in that we have our two guests um Tristan and Helena Tristan and Helena one is from biology department and other is from anthropology department so we have a biologist with us and we have an anthropologist with us to talk on that topic just to give you the background we have seen a new strain of coronavirus and that has been uh, infected 12 people till today and that is a new mutilated version and this one is more dangerous than the other one and because of this already uk has blocked its border with denmark and denmark has taken preemptive action to stop the virus and one of the action is killing all the mink so with that note i would like to ask tristan first about his opinion regarding this decision so it's definitely a difficult issue uh, there are several aspects as you say there's the economic aspect and the animal rights aspect so already in politics today we are seeing a lot of particularly right wing politicians complaining about the economic dimensions all of the people being effectively put out of their jobs but you also have people from the left coming in and saying that this is an unethical act because of the sheer scale of the killing i think it's important when we want to tackle this issue to look both at the issue as it is but also the broader context i am in favor of this measure as it is right now i think it's necessary I also think it's a very unfortunate situation that we've only gotten into in the first place because of bad decisions and unethical decisions made up until this point. And that is in brief my opinion. Thank you Tristan. Uh and and you have said you are in favor of the decision given the context of its importance to stop uh, uh the outbreak. And now I would like to ask uh, from our anthropologists uh, what's her opinion on that? I think the uh, unfortunate aspect of this whole situation is the fact that 1% of our GDP as far as I know has been told uh, is from this industry. I think that was unfortunate to begin with and I think I hope that with the killing of these minks we have stopped an industry and stopped future minks from uh, from suffering and I think this goes beyond the uh economic perspective of of course I do realize that people's livelihoods are being ruined and that is in itself isolated uh, a sad sad case but it also reminds me of another report i saw on tv with uh, um people interviewing undertakers who um were complaining that less danes were dying because of the covid measures and i mean yeah sure it's it's too bad for you that your undertaking business is being ruined but i mean you are an undertaker you're dealing with dead people it's not really you know is it a concern uh for you that we should have so i guess my uh, my opinion is that it is it is good these measures that have been taken that and what we see that you both are concerned about the human security and there is no doubt that human life is more important in in the given argument but at the same time there are animal rights activists who have been very critical about the uh, this kind of animal breeding for Uh, you know industries such as a uh, fashion industry uh, which are not necessarily directly contributing in our life but mostly important for maintaining the status and maintaining uh, you know this high fashion standard now given that the mink the way they have been kept in denmark as well as in other places such as russia and uh, china these mink has been already subjected to uh, in human condition i'm not sure whether i should use even human condition because you know we human are doing that condition what's your take on that i will say for starters that i broadly agree with helena in the fact that this is an unfortunate situation to have gotten into in the first place and i sympathize with the mink farmers whose livelihoods and the entire career and what they spend their life on is now being not only jeopardized but effectively uh, shuttered it's being stopped but at the same time i can't be sad that this industry is seeing a closure because it is in terms of animal rights in terms of what animal welfare 
a fairly ethically horrendous situation. And it's clearly, in terms of human wealth, in terms of um, disease control, in terms of basic health, very uh, difficult to justify. Because when you keep animals together like this, it's effectively like the um, giant farms in China, where you have thousands upon thousands of livestock of pigs kept together, which are breeding grounds for disease. It's the same here. This is why many other places, um, many other countries in Europe alone, have seen giant mink uh, outbreaks of coronavirus among mink. So this is a good thing going forward in terms of the industry. But I think there's two separate questions here that need to be tackled. One is whether or not the mink industry is justifiable as an industry, as a, an unnecessary expense, right? Can we justify the amount of animal cruelty contrary to human gain? The second question is whether the government's action in this specific crisis is justifiable. Because hypothetically, in fact, that's my position, you could be against the one, against the mink industry, while still being for government intervention in this case. I actually think that's similar to Helene's position as well. Thanks, Tristan. Uh, with that point, I will go to Helena with a more generalized question. It's not about the mink only. It's about you know, all other animals that we use to uh, to produce meat, to produce milk, or to produce skin uh, that, that directly contribute in our economy as well as uh, very regular things in our daily life. But we have seen like indiscriminate behavior towards them. For instance, take the example of rabbit. Or uh, what we see, uh, like if, if a cosmetic product needs to get uh, the you know permission to be in the market, it has to go through some taste and one of the taste is that you would put that cosmetic in the eyes of a rabbit and you would well uh, wet and see how it behaves and how it reacts and this could lead to the blindness of the uh, you know rabbit now we, we have seen this kind of behavior but from that context what do you think what is the debate in uh, anthropology or for instance sociology regarding the animal rights well, there is the whole um, debate in anthropology of uh, regarding animals as persons. And this kind of goes around the whole topic of uh, animals and their humanity. Of course, they're not human, but uh, personality and to be a person doesn't necessarily uh, go with being a human being. You can have personality without and having humanity. And from that perspective, of course, the, the suffering is not something that is justified. Very simply. Uh, thank you, Helena. You mentioned a very important point, the person. You know, like uh, Tristan, you may agree with me uh, as well, because the concept of person has, has been changed. Uh, I mean, the normal definition of personhood has been changed by recognizing industries or corporations as person. Like in the legal term, yes. you can, you know, put a lawsuit against Google and against Facebook, but they're not person. The loss, uh, so uh, they have, so Google or Facebook has been recognized as person because you can file a lawsuit against them, but they don't have any life. Why we see like a cow or a kind, uh, a rabbit or, or, or anything uh, who are animal other than human, they have life. So why not personhood has been given uh, considering their rights? Animals would make. Yes, uh, I'll, start, I'll start by saying that I think the fact that we are seeing in certain countries the classification of corporations as people more than anything shows not just that we have changed the definition of personal but that we've completely forgotten what it actually means. It seems to me essentially to be a, an economic decision. It's a, somewhat cynical. I don't think that animals qualify as people, but I do think that distinction between the animal and the person demands explanation. What do we mean when we say that humans are people while orangutans aren't? Animals clearly feel and they clearly think. That's undeniable. You even have some that use some degree of logical thinking, like crows understand water displacement. They understand that if you plop a thing into water, the water level rises. That's clearly thought that's going on there. It's not just pre-programmed behavior. But animals are not rational. They don't have abstract thought, as far as we can tell, with every indication. They don't produce anything which has a purely abstract or symbolic function. And that, I think, is the key to personhood. That's what makes a human 
a person rather than just an animal. It's also why corporations are not people because they're not even they're right, neither feeling, thinking, nor reasoning. They're nothing. It's an abstraction. Oh, but I, uh, I, I will I will come to you, uh, Helena. But just he mentioned a very interesting debate, which is. Uh, animals are not rational, so rationality is attached to its intelligence. And as Aristotle once said, those are people, or like intelligent people are supposed to get service from less intelligent people. And that's how uh, the slavery in the Greek society has been justified. And we are seeing like throughout the time, uh, be it uh, Kant or be it other Western philosophers, th there is this consistent idea based on intelligence uh, and, and, and a society which should be based on intelligence and who are not having the intelligence would be subject to, you know, uh, not given the person with that kind of argument. But I may interject very briefly. Yes, but uh, what do you think about that? Uh, what, what is your yes. argument on that? I have one comment and then I'll let it on to Helena. I do not think that intelligence and reason are actually correlated at all. I think you could hypothetically have an animal that's just as intelligent as any person without being capable of reason. Reason, as I consider it, is purely the ability to abstract, to think in symbology, to think of things which are completely unrelated to the present corporeal situation. That's not related to intelligence. Intelligence is just how quickly you think and problem solve and rationalize. So a crow could be very intelligent without being reasoned. Okay, uh, that's an interesting argument. But Elena, you wanted to add something on that. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I think I, I want to backtrack a bit, of course, just First thing, you know, Kant, big old racist. Mm -hmm. All of your life. Just put, that, yeah. put that, put a pin in that. Uh, but the the legal uh, stuff that you just previously uh, discussed, I remember from uh, my law study that uh, the the thing of uh, corporations as persons, that is about being able to trace the will and the workings of uh, an industry or a or a firm to its founder or to its founding group. So there is actually something behind that. If you cannot trace that, then there is maybe less of an argument to treat the corporation as a person. Uh, so yeah, it's all about tracing back. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's also, it's an interesting debate, the debate about, about rationality and what, what counts as, as giving you rights. Um, and I think in, in all the debates about rationality, we often just forget the emotional aspect that is involved in everything. Also, rationality, the people that are pursuing that rationality is totally uh, like absent in emotion and the other way. No, everything is, is entangled. Uh, and in such a way, I think we should give it more validity, validity the, uh, the emotions and the experiences of these animals and not, and not put it down. But that is a bigger conversation about like the hierarchy we place such things in, the emotional experiences are placed generally below um, the rationales and the rational uh, thinking and acts of whatever definition they are. Thank you. Uh, and you, you mentioned a very important point, which is uh, the feelings. And actually, it's Bentham who first time recognized that animals do feel the pain as humans do feel pain. Because before Bentham, what we see, like Kant, Descartes, or Aquinas, all the great philosophers of these uh, times, they never recognized animal who, uh, they, they rejected animal rights based on that they are not intelligent, and they rejected uh, animal rights also because uh, they are supposed to serve human, so human are in the center. But what we see, as Anandi was saying, that the feelings of animal is important because they also feel pain, likewise human. Now, given that, any one of you could take the position, do you think it's morally ethical to, to kill mink or to treat mink the, uh, mink, uh, the way it has been treated in Denmark? I do wish to answer that. I also do wish to address some of the things Helena said and some of the things you said. Um, uh, where to begin? In terms of the racism point, I want to get back to that. But in terms of Descartes and the Enlightenment philosophy, I agree with them on many points. This is one of them. I think the idea that animals are just automata, which is what they thought, is a clear example of somebody being so stuck up in their philosophizing that they've never even looked at a dog. And you don't need to spend much time with one to understand that clearly, at the very least, there are feelings going on. But in terms of feelings and rationality and reasoning, which is something Helena mentioned, 
I do think that emotions are different from reasoning. You can't completely separate the two. They, they, inter, like they relate to each other. Well, I, I, I will just uh, interrupt there, uh, Tristan, because it's more of, So we understand the argument that, okay, the, the argument that we are saying that animals are not rational and not as intelligent, that is, that is a debatable debate. Uh, but the thing is that it's very genuine that a human do feel pain as well as an animal do feel pain. And from that perspective, is it okay or is it morally okay to uh, put them in such a condition while from the beginning to the end of their life they would be going through this painful uh, experience just because we need to extract more resources. We need to maintain the fashion standard, or maybe the Danish queen needs to wear a very excellent fire. On that point, then, I'll say that there's two things. The first is the question, when we talk about considering to kill an animal, we need to consider two things. The first one is, is the death of this animal necessary? And the second one is, is the degree of suffering which this animal undergoes necessary? So for instance, I am against mink farming, in part because of the practical aspects, but also because it's unnecessary. We don't need mink fur, nobody's dependent on it. Um, and we don't use the mink for anything else, which seems to me ethically unjustifiable. So we're killing an animal and subjecting them to horrible lives purely for the sake of a human luxury. On the other hand, we also, I mean, okay, leather. We can wear things that aren't made from animals and clothes. So does that make leather clothes, uh, any form of clothes made from dead animals, unethical? I don't think so necessarily, but I think it depends on what, what you use the rest of the animal for. So if you take a cow, if you kill the cow, eat the cow, and use the leather, that's justifiable because the whole animal is being used for practical purposes, and the leather would be there anyway, it would just be thrown out. So you're not killing the animal just for this luxury, it's an addition. This is where minks are different you're not eating them. Okay, so, yes, of course, please. Just to just put that down, I mean, one might say that the profit is never ethical. So the, to say the, the ethics of this, uh, of profiting of this, uh, of this venture, you can't say that, that it's something ethical. Just the whole, the whole business in itself, profit in any regard, is never ethical. So I feel all uh, facets of this is an unethical. I Thanks. Uh, that's that's a very strong uh, argument. But before going to that argument, uh, there is an important point you mentioned, like need, killing for need. Now, is it the modern uh, consumption is all about need or it's all about taste? Isn't it? The, the modern consumption that we are having, like the beef burger that we, are, we want to have, it's less about the need, the need of meat, but more about the taste of the meat. Which one is uh, now actually playing the role? Do you have? Do you like to take? A... Yeah, I mean, uh, also in the the debates about economy, at least in anthropology, we have the position that uh, consumption is is like building character, building the individual, and this is how we view ourselves. We view ourselves through what we consume. It's an American uh, theory. I don't remember his name, uh, and that is that is very true. That's how we build up ourselves and our relations to others through what we what we consume, and it's such an integral part, it seems, today. Uh, and the question is just whether we can change this whole view of how to build your yourself. Uh, thank you. So uh, I would like to uh, recall one of the modern-day activists and philosophers. He's actually an Australian philosopher, uh, Peter Singer. He wrote this book, The Animal Liberation. And he was, for a long time, trying to advocate uh, the animal rights and he he popularized this term speciesism or uh, species so uh, what we see uh, as you were saying uh, Tristan need and as I was saying taste and as you were saying looking at the emotional aspect of it uh, if we put all together what we see like for instance if you are having a cat or and you have given it a good care throughout the life and when it died are you going to eat it? No, 
But that's because of cultural pre uh, preconditions. I mean, the idea of pets as we have them today is a very modern notion. Back in the day, for most of human history, still in most parts of the world, people live together with their livestock. They often have deep personal relationships with their livestock. They like and care about these animals, but they still eat them at the end because that's just part of the relationship. So this idea of having like put in horses, eating horse meat is incredibly taboo in the West today because horses are pets. But killing a million cows, that's fine, because cows aren't pets. That's an arbitrary division, and that didn't used to be the case. So, actually, that is specicism Peter Singer was saying, that you would kill some, and you would not kill some, and that's the discrimination. You're not considering all the things that you were saying, intelligence, all the things you were saying, uh, feelings or everything. But yes, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I mean, one could say that this consumption was like the ultimate act of, uh, of love if you've had a loving relationship with something well then you consume it and then yeah. it's like a consummation of this uh, of this bond of course that's a, a kind of a far away thought but you know there's something to it so you can turn it around praying mantis approach to marriage oh it, well there are cultures where it's okay to uh, you know eat flesh from the loved ones yeah. and that's considered as as something good things a respect to uh, to to the dead animal or something. Which no, they're they're you know they're being uh, they're servicing their uh, relatives and their people one last time. That used to be very common in Papua New Guinea. They stopped because it gave them a degenerative brain disease, trying to uh, transmitted exclusively through cannibalism. But that's an example of that kind of behavior. Well, I mean, there is a huge debate on cannibalism, especially yes. in the context of you know uh, uh, English depiction of can cannibalism uh, about the other culture. So, uh, but as of now, for this debate, uh, let's address one uh, very last question that, how, how do you look at that, this modern industrial meat production, modern industrial steam production, uh, what is your take on that? Well, again, that it is, it is unethical just uh, as, a, as, a, as a standpoint, I mean, that's, I feel like that's the, the general notion of it. Is unethical to me, uh, and it's all about project profits. It's all about producing more and more, and then you do forget a lot of ethical concerns. So I feel like it isn't. It isn't much. There isn't much more to elaborate on that. I feel it's it's very plain and simple. What's your take on that, Christian? I actually think it's a very complex issue because at the end of the day, I think many people, maybe even most people, would agree that there's sort of a gut reaction when you look at, say, a factory chicken farm, like all of these chickens cooped together, that this is wrong. But you have to ask, why is it wrong? Or, to phrase it a different way, what would make it right? What is the ethical way of killing an animal? When is it allowed? Is it allowed? Because, of course, taken to the extreme, you arrive at the vegan position that killing animals is always wrong. But if we want to disagree with that and say that it's sometimes justified, well, then we have a very big zone and gray area. You pointed out at one point earlier that a lot of the meat production we have today is still a matter of desire, a matter of what we want to eat. Um, so even though we would consider, say, pork production necessary in a way, because we need to eat, we could eat other things. And it's true, we could hypothetically have a world where everyone is vegan. So. Is it ethical to kill these livestock, these animals, when we hypothetically could not, not do that? And I think that question ultimately comes down to the fundamental question of our relationship with nature. Is death and killing things intrinsically wrong? That's the big I, question. I think, yes. I mean, one could also take the position that uh, a lot of meat eaters seem to take that a lot of these livestock, if they weren't uh, kept alive for to be killed and to be consumed, they wouldn't exist at all. These cows wouldn't exist. They couldn't make it on their own. So really the, the debate becomes uh, the life of suffering or relative suffering versus no life at all. Um, and that's their position. I think that's an interesting position because what would you rather want? Okay. Uh, now, you, you, you mentioned a very important point that uh, which one is better, no life at all or like life with minimum survival chances? Now, interestingly, uh, have we given them a chance to decide what they want? Because we actually invaded in their realm. Uh, we, we took what we needed from them. And then we are philosophizing everything in the name of justice, in the name of need, in the name of providing uh, facilities to them. What's your, what's your take on that? You can, you can say that.
say the same thing about a baby being born in an unfortunate family or family who live under unfortunate circumstances, that this baby wasn't asked, do I want to be born? Uh, it was just placed here and placed under the you know, strenuous relationships or whatever, going out in a, in a tough life. But we don't uh, often like, you know, of course this baby should have been born. Of course it has the chance. Um, so I feel like it's it's the same it's the same here like going into maybe an abortion debate. You know? Okay, uh, I have a comment Actually, about that. Yes, not, not only the abortion part, but the other part. Okay, I I would be coming to you, but I I really didn't mean the abortion debate. What I mean, take the example no, I, of I know. Take the example of Danish mink industry. Mm -hmm. So the mink that oh. the Danish. Uh, uh, farm are having is mink are from America. You know, this mink do not have any passport or visa to come in Denmark. They have been uh, br brought from America, they have been taken in Denmark, and uh, they have been breed here and uh, they are found here. Now, some of the mink who somehow was able to skip uh, from the farm, now they're living in the Danish wildlife and they are very dangerous to the local flora and fauna. Because this mink are carnival animals, they, they kill uh, indiscriminately, even they don't need it. Now, of course, I do understand that, as you were saying, mink are not rational animals, but it's also, they didn't choose to come in Denmark. They were just living in American areas. It's we who decided to bring them here and to cultivate uh, their skin for our need. So what is that, this global capital working in that place? I think there's an interesting fact actually, there is a native European mink which was largely driven to extinction because of the imported American mink which just got bred in so large numbers that they sort of overwhelmed the native species which wasn't being farmed. But that leads to actually uh, Helena's point about, well the media is saying that if we weren't farming all of these animals they wouldn't be here at all. In terms of the response to the government's decision to cull all these mink, what is the alternative? There's none. They are all going to die. Inevitably. If the government calls them, obviously they die. If the government doesn't call them all now, they're going to die anyway, because that's the way their fur is extracted. They're killed in the process. But even if we didn't kill them all now and we abolished the mink industry, where are they going to go? They're not going to go into the Danish nature. They're not going to be sent back to the US. They're not all going to be sold as pets. The farmers definitely aren't going to keep housing and feeding them. They're all going to be killed no matter what. That's a certainty. It's unfortunate, but it's just part of the situation. Uh, and isn't it that they are getting, uh, you know, culled? But we are not using the word "kill," cull. But that sounds more sweet in our ear to listen. Is that's that's a that's a messy problem that human created. It's uh, mink has very little responsibility in that problem. It's actually human problem. It's not the mink problem, isn't it? Well, I would say in relation to the uh, question of whether or not the mink have had a say in the matter, uh, that actually brings us back to the whole reasoning animal sort of point. Mink can't have a say in that process because mink can't make that kind of decision. You literally cannot explain the dilemma to them because they are incapable of dealing with them. They are feeling animals, they are, they are thinking animals, but their thoughts are not rational. And the question of say, hypothetically, I mean, even humans have the question, would you rather live um, a free life in nature with a high chance of dying young at, for some horrible cause, or would you like to live a relatively healthy life being fed until a certain age when you're slaughtered? You need a rational mind to make that sort of decision, which is why we don't treat animals like people. This is why we don't wait for them to make these decisions, because they fundamentally cannot. Okay. Uh... So I, I do disagree with uh, the last point that you made. Of course, I, I, I have no argument regarding the intelligent capacity of a mink to decide or a cow to decide, but that also do not justify uh, that slavery or, or kind of like subjected consumption would allow someone to take a decision about uh, things like, even if we don't consider mink as person, at least they are things. Feeling things. Yeah. Uh, now that's the point. Uh, the fishing, or or like, thank you very much for bringing that example. Uh, is fishing unethical? Yeah, that's the question. What's your take on that? Mm. I mean, one could uh, maybe take to the the Jewish uh, scriptures and Mary Douglas's uh, analysis of clean and unclean and her view on, for 
example, the fish, you know, what, what do we view as clean? What do we view as, as unclean? What attributes of the animal are the clean attributes and which are the, the unclean ones? And it is funny. I feel like maybe we would have to look at an animal and it would have enough features sort of kind of resembling ours and a manner resembling ours. And then we would recognize ourselves and say, oh, that's a, that's a sweet thing. And that's a bad cat. And then we look at a fish. It's just a weird scaly uh, or crawly, sprawling thing uh, on the deck of a ship. And we don't recognize anything in it. And then we are quick to say, well, that is, that's nothing that we can connect with emotionally. Uh, but another thing about the mink, I think it is sort of interesting in the way that the mink are sort of given a personality, but an evil one. Uh, in this whole debate, which is why it's being justified for killing them. So they, they don't have the personality to the extent that we give them any rights, but they sort of do to the extent that we can say, these creatures are fucking evil, so it's fine that we're <laughs> killing them. You know. I have a comment on that. Uh, yes, what's your comment? I'm glad you brought up the Bible or the Torah in this case, because I was just about to do it for a different reason, which is that if we are saying killing animals like fish and whatnot, believe you fundamentally answered uh, one of the things you're getting to which is if we're going to say that that's wrong why why where are we getting that from on what basis i don't want to get too far into this because it's a separate conversation but in general traditional morality our traditional rights and wrongs derive from religious texts and the bible certainly doesn't condemn killing animals in principle nor does the quran nor do really any religions i can think of except maybe some interpretations of buddhism but not even all of them um so if that's where we're getting our morality from it's not unethical but if that's not where we're getting our morality from well then either everything is relativist we make our own morality in which case we're not in any position to judge others for what they do we're not in any position to make blanket condemnations or we're going to do an appeal to nature and say well if it happens in nature then it's ethical but humans are omnivores. That's our evolutionary heritage. Predators are what the transition to predation is a key step of our evolution. So by that standard, it's also fine to kill. So how would you justify saying that killing is fundamentally unethical? Where's that coming from? That law, that moral demand? Well, uh, I think uh, the question itself is coming from uh, a point of view that we need to question our own action. Uh, because as a human being, we take action and then we, we justify it. And, 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 and that's how we continue to keep doing that. A hundred years ago, the slavery was a very normal thing. But right now, we are very critical about slavery. We never know that hundred years later, the killing of animals in the way that has been going on in an industrial scale would be considered as like a slavery. We, we never know. Because the thing is that unless we question these kind of behaviors and practice, we would, we would never be certain about what mistakes we are doing, uh, consciously or unconsciously. So that was the point uh, to ask this question. And we are very in of our discussion. Uh, and I would like to close our discussion with a hypothetical question. Mm -hmm. And as we all know that right now, there is a pandemic going on in the world. The entire economy has been shattered. And human life are in a state. And we are, to some extent, find it that first we thought that is responsible. Or now, in case of Denmark, the new version of coronavirus, it's the mink who are responsible. And then uh, there is this notion that to save human life, it's okay to, to kill or to eliminate whoever the responsible one to spread that virus. Or cause the virus. Now, just think of a flip up situation where it's not the world of human, but it's the world of mink or bat or, or cows who are making all the decisions. Uh, and do you think in that utopian environment, their decision, like a mink prime minister, is, is coming to the press and saying, we should kill all humans because they are spreading coronavirus for the safety of mink. If we don't kill them right now, they wouldn't survive anyway in the wildness. So it's better, just let's get rid of them. So that's a hypothetical situation and that's the question. I would like to know your comment from, I would like to go to heaven for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're under the mink hegemony, well then of 
course, you will you will agree. The link are in charge. They are controlling the details and are empowering them, and that is the world view. And yeah, how is that different? That isn't any different. I think that perfectly sums up why this is wrong and why this is unethical. Um, yeah, of course, we all know that the mice are the ones in charge. <laughs> Not the mice. Thank you, uh, Tristan. I thought it was the onyx. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Well, about that scenario, so are we talking about a role reversal scenario, basically? The humans are equivalent to the mink, and the mink are equivalent to the humans. Well, in that case, if the humans are the ones being farmed like that, and the mink are the ones having conversations, then the minks are the ones that are people. And a human, presumably in this world, if it we're actually just flipping it, humans are just animals. So I don't think that changes anything. In that scenario, the mink are the ones who are reasoning, rational souls, as we would say, and the humans aren't. Then the humans are just like any other primate. So I don't actually think that that changes things. I think it's the exact same scenario because the point, at least as I see it, that the key issue here is whether this being, this entity, is capable of reasoning. If they are, then they are people, even if they're not human. And if they're not, then, then it's a completely different scenario. The very last thing I'll say is actually bring it back to slavery, which you've mentioned several times. I actually think this focus on the rational soul contra just the feeling and the thinking soul is a key anti-slavery argument. Because sla um, people who are, again, who are proponents of scientific racism and slavery, they latched onto many different theories of biology, early theories of Darwinism, to justify, well, we have all these separate evolutionary origins, and look, blacks aren't even related to whites, so clearly we can treat them poorly because they're different species. I don't think that matters. All that matters is whether or not they are rational, reasoning beings, which they clearly are. Everything else is pure details, it's pure investigation, but it's ultimately irrelevant to the question of race. Uh, thank you, Tristan and Galena. The reason of this debate was not to advocate any certain uh, type of ideology, but to question what we are doing and why we are doing and how we are doing things. Uh, so, as I was giving the example in the previous time, that 100 years back, slavery was a very accepted norm. But now, uh, in, in 2020, uh, thinking about slavery, making someone a slave, is a very bad thought. And maybe at some point, we will start questioning our recent behavior, which is based on taste, not based on need. And also the way we treat other animals, non-human animals. Uh, and, and maybe that kind of moral question would to some extent make us more empathetic towards them, uh, towards uh, non-human animals and we would at some point may be able to establish uh, equal consideration of interest where the interest of human and interest of other non-human animals would be served. And thank you very much for being with us. I would really appreciate uh, Helen for joining with us and Tristan for joining in this evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.